Hey guys, welcome back. In this video, we're going to look at motion time graphs. Specifically, we're going to start by looking at sign convention, and then we're going to look at velocity time graphs, displacement time graphs, and acceleration time graphs. So let's get started. So we're going to start by looking at sign convention. So it says here, before we investigate motion, it is important to define a sign convention when presented with a particular problem. This is because we use vectors to represent motion, and direction is crucial when dealing with vectors, so you should know that by now. Usually, but not always, it is easiest to define upwards motion as positive and downwards motion as negative, because that kind of makes sense intuitively. Similarly, we can often define motion to the right as positive and motion to the left as negative. So here's a little summary for you. So we've got anything moving upwards is going to be positive and anything moving to the right is going to be positive and anything moving to the left or downwards is going to be negative. Now this is something that we can use as a general rule throughout the whole higher physics course but sometimes problems might lend themselves better to having downwards motion as positive and upwards motion as negative. For example, if you've got an object that is moving downwards to begin with, you might want to start calling that downwards motion positive instead of negative. But more often than not, we will be using this sign convention. So just remember that anything moving to the right or upwards is going to be positive. Anything moving to the left or downwards is going to be negative. So we're now going to move on to types of motion time graphs. And we're going to start with the one that you should be most familiar with, which is velocity time graphs. So a lot of what we're about to do should be revision from National 5. So why do we use graphs first of all? Well, graphs are often used in the scientific community to help us understand the motion of an object. By looking at a velocity time graph or a displacement time graph or an acceleration time graph, we can work out at a glance what an object is doing rather than having to read a couple of sentences or a paragraph about what is happening to an object. So in this section we're going to look at three types of motion time graphs which are displacement time graphs, velocity time graphs and acceleration time graphs, but we're going to start with velocity time graphs. So the first shape that we should remember from National 5 is one for constant velocity. So it says here that a horizontal line on a velocity time graph represents a constant velocity. So if you plot V against T, you should have a straight line if your object is travelling at a constant speed or a constant velocity. You should also remember that a positively sloping line on a velocity time graph represents a uniform acceleration, or a constant acceleration is another word for that. So an object with a constant acceleration will have a graph that looks like this, with a positively sloping line. On the other hand, a negatively sloping line on a velocity time graph represents a uniform deceleration or a constant deceleration. And remember, a deceleration is just a negative acceleration which means the object is slowing down. So if you're doing a numerical problem and you get a final acceleration which is a negative value, then that just means that your object is slowing down rather than speeding up. So for an object that has a constant deceleration, we should see this negatively sloping line. Another slightly trickier concept that we should remember from National 5 is that as velocity is a vector quantity, a negative value indicates motion in the opposite direction. So if we want to show a change in direction of an object on a velocity time graph, we need to jump between the axes here. So we need to go either below the axis or above the axis, depending on where we are to start with. So just as an example, it says here that the object decelerates uniformly to rest before accelerating uniformly in the opposite direction. So if we look here, we'll see that our velocity time graph shows an object starts with some non-zero positive velocity and our velocity is decreasing, so that's our constant deceleration there, until the object comes comes to a stop, so at this point it's at rest because it's at 0 meters per second. And then you'll see that the speed continues below the axis in the negative quadrant, which means that our object has increased in speed but has done so in the negative direction. So there's actually been a change in direction after it's come to a stop here. So this example is in fact the velocity time graph for a ball that has been thrown upwards into the air. So the ball will start with some velocity that you throw it at from your hand, and when it leaves your hand it's got this velocity but as soon as it's travelling upwards, it's going to start slowing down and slowing down until it reaches a stop at its highest point in motion, at which point it's going to start travelling back down the way. Now remember we said for sign convention that we can define upwards as positive and downwards as negative. So in this case, we're dealing with upwards motion, so we're in the positive quadrant. And for a negative direction, for our object moving down the way this time, we're in the negative quadrant. So the object is at its highest point in motion here, and then it falls back down towards the ground, but its speed will increase and increase until it hits the ground. Moving on now, we're going to recap how to determine the displacement from a velocity time graph. 
So it says here that displacement is equal to the area under a velocity time graph. So that means that S is equal to the area under a VT graph for short. So if you wanted a quick way of remembering it, I've put that in a box just because it's important, but it's not like an equation or anything like that. So to find the total area, it can help to split the graph into shapes. For example, rectangles and triangles, you're never gonna see anything different to a rectangle or a triangle. And you then calculate the area for each of these shapes separately. These areas can then be added together to give you the total area under the graph, so your total displacement. And it should be noted that any area above the axis will be positive and any area below the axis will be negative. You may find the following formulae helpful. So the area of a rectangle is length times breadth, L times B, and the area of a triangle is a half times base times height, which is a half times B times H. Just a quick note to say that you may also be given a speed time graph instead of a velocity time graph and asked to find the distance instead of displacement. This would involve calculating the area under the graph in the exact same way as shown above, but you would just be using speed and distance rather than velocity and displacement. And you should also note what we mean by the area under the graph. So it means the area enclosed between the line and the x-axis, not just the areas under the x-axis. Here's an example just to put this into context. So this example says, to find the displacement of the object with the following VT graph, the area under the graph must be calculated. So there's our VT graph there, and we need to calculate the area under the graph to find the total displacement. So we can split the graph into two triangles, one above the axis and one below the axis there. And so above the axis, our area of the triangle is a half times base times height, which is a half times the six times the 10, which gives us 30 meters squared, and that's positive. And below the axis, we have a half times the base, which is a half times six times the height, which is minus 10 this time because we're below the axis. So that gives us a negative area of minus 30. And adding them together to get the total displacement, we get 30 minus 30, which gives us a magnitude for the total displacement of zero meters. Now, because it's magnitude, we don't need a direction. Another thing you should remember from National 5 is how to determine the acceleration from a velocity time graph. So it says here that acceleration is equal to the gradient of the line on a velocity time graph. So again, I've summarized this a bit in the box to show it's important. So it says A equals the gradient of the line on a VT graph. And to calculate the gradient of a line, remember from maths and from National 5, we use this relationship here. So m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. That's the change in y over the change in x. Where x1, y1 and x2, y2 are two points on the line. So just as an example, it says here to determine the acceleration of the object with the following VT graph, so this thing here, the gradient of the line must be calculated. To find the two points in the line, use a ruler and mark on dashed lines. You don't have to mark on dashed lines, but it does help you to see where the actual points line up. So choosing two points on the line here, we have x1, y1 equals 2, 5. So that's this point here, 2, 5 is that. And we've got x2, y2 equals 10, 25. So we've got 10 along, 25 up is this point here. So notice I've chosen two points at either end of my line. And we then do the area equals the gradient of the line, which is our m, which is the change in y over the change in x. So we do our 25 minus 5 over 10 minus 2, which gives us 20 divided by 8, which when you put that into your calculator, gives us 2.5 meters per second squared in the positive direction. Now I've put that direction in because acceleration is a vector, remember, and we need a direction but a lot of the time you'll be asked to find the magnitude of a vector. Finally, we're gonna look at displacement time and acceleration time graphs. So it says here that we have just seen how to calculate the displacement and acceleration from velocity time graphs. This means that if we're given one graph of motion, we can work out the others. So it helps to look at this picture for what we're seeing here. And it says to move from a displacement time graph to a velocity time graph, we must calculate the gradient of the line. So if we're going from a displacement time to a velocity time graph, we need to calculate the gradient. And we also need to do the same to move from a velocity time graph to an acceleration time graph. So if we're moving from a displacement time graph to a velocity time graph, we need to calculate the gradient of the line on our graph. And also to get an acceleration time graph from a velocity time graph, we again need to calculate the gradient of the line on our graph. However, to move back the way from an acceleration time to a velocity time graph, then what you need to do is calculate the area under the graph. And we also need to do the same when we're moving from a velocity time graph to a displacement time graph. So we need to calculate the area under the graph. So the way I like to remember this is the first type of graph you could start with is a displacement time graph, and then to get the velocity time graph from that, you take the gradient, 
and if you want to get an acceleration time graph from that velocity time graph, you then take the gradient again. But if you were starting with an acceleration time graph and you wanted to move backwards to a velocity time graph, you could calculate the area under the graph, and then if you had a velocity time graph and you wanted to find a displacement time graph from that, you could calculate the area under the graph. That's all from me folks, I hope you found the video useful, if you did, give it one of these, subscribe and I'll see you in the next one. Take care. Whoa.